The process of industrialization in Russia began long after other European countries and uh, this developed in a context where the principal features of industrial um, societies in other parts of Europe had become already settled. Indeed, Russia had some economic and social connections with Europe all through this period. But nevertheless, unlike in the western parts of Europe, where the principal drive towards industrialization was from economic imperatives of competition against the burgeoning industrial country of England and then France and Germany, in Russia, by contrast, the principal drive towards industrialization came from political establishment, not economic imperatives. This was essentially because of some structural peculiarities associated with the Russian Empire. In the, in the first place was the problem of the market. The Russian Empire, despite being a huge and sprawling empire under a centralized political command, as it were, of the Tsar, was essentially a cluster of several regional economies. In the West, in European Russia, comprising what is today the, uh, the central industrial region of Russia, alongside the Baltic states of what today are the Baltic states of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, along with the Russian-occupied region of Poland. This together constituted what was known as the Central Industrial and Central Agricultural Region, spreading from St. Petersburg in the north to about Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod in the south, from Warsaw in the west to Moscow in the east. Here, the principal economic activity constituted of the commerce that came in from the Baltic regions, the industrial activity in and around the region of Moscow in the Volga Basin in the Nizhny Novgorod region, catering to the demands of the urban constellations of St. Petersburg, Warsaw, and Moscow, along with an agricultural hinterland that catered to the needs of uh, the uh, courtly and administrative centers of Moscow and St. Petersburg. To the south, lay the breadbasket of the Tsarist Empire in Ukraine, the mineral-rich region of the Urals, the regions of the Russian Empire in the Caucasus, such as Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, which were acquired from the Persian Empire in the early 19th century, and the Russian uh, penetration of Central Asia of the 1860s, where the Turkestan region came up in what is today the Central Asian republics of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. To the east, in Asiatic Russia, lay the vast provinces, the vast valleys of the river Sibir, inhabited by the tribals of Yakutias and Tunguns. These was principally the fur trapping and hide countries. This is where Russia was content only in exploiting the surplus generated in terms of the, uh, the animal-based, the animal husbandry-based and far-trapping-based economy of the East. In the Turkestan region, the principal activity uh, was, uh, it comprised of the, far uh, of the animal husbandry milk and dairy products, as also the, uh, it constituted the principal staging post of agrarian commerce with the Ottoman and Persian empires. So, the various regions of Russia, the, the Central Industrial Region, the Urals, the Ukraine, the Central Asian um, component of Russia, and also the far trapping uh, um, East, these were almost independent regional economies which were united by the fact that surplus was extracted from all of them towards uh, uh, converging in the capital region of St. Petersburg. In Turkestan, the principal trading partner happened to be the Persian Empire. In Ukraine, the principal uh, commercial partner happened to be the Ottoman Empire. So the various regional economies had different orientations. None of them actually converged to create a large domestic market that is considered to be almost a, uh, an essential feature of any uh, industrial development. There was an additional problem to do with the market. Russia had very poor, very backward transportation system and very backward communication system. 
in the 19th century at a time when Europe, western parts of Europe were advancing uh, at a very, at, at almost a breathtaking speed when Britain had integrated, physically integrated the entire component of the British Isles. France and Germany were also being united by good roadworks and good railways. In Tsarist Russia, there was a major problem. The physical uh, transportation, the, the roadworks were almost impossible given the traditional technology that was uh, in, involved uh, to keep or maintain, to keep and maintain a road that would be almost perennial. In the Russian north, in the St. Petersburg region, the coast, the, the coastal region almost, almost tended to freeze and the, the principal navigational network of the Volga and the Don and the Dnieper tended to freeze up during the months of November to March. Between November to March, almost no riverine uh, nav transportation was possible, which meant that between November and March, when the river was completely frozen, no boats could sail up towards St. Petersburg and nothing could sail down either. In fact, even between March and April, as the thaw began to lose, uh, begins to sort of break up the frozen river, chunks of ice would float and that would also make navigation in itself very, very difficult. So essentially between November and April, communica all communication tended to break down between St. Petersburg and uh, Moscow. There was considerable connectivity between uh, the Urals and the Ukraine regions in the south and Moscow in the center. But for any major transportation into the principal demographic region of the central industrial region, all transport had to be done essentially between uh, during the summer months between April and October. So if because of the inadequacy of the roads, because of the bad condition of the roads in this extreme weather, between April of a year and October of a year, if goods would be transported between the Urals and Moscow, by the time they reached, um, by the time they reached St. Petersburg, the winter would have to pass. So goods would move uh, between April and September, and then as it were, they would chill out between September and April, uh, next April, and only after there was a thaw that could, could move upwards, which basically meant that if there was, uh, there was to emerge a market, it would have to be a market which could be catered over a period of a hundred, uh, over a year and a half. And this prevented any consumer durable industry ever emerging. All items of daily use, all manufactured items of daily use had to be produced with the idea that it would be consumed in the immediate region adjacent to the area of production. So all the items of manufacture, all manufactured goods that would have any market in the central industrial region would tend to be manufactured in the central industrial region itself. Whatever would be manufactured in the Urals would have to be consumed over there. There was no con concept of a large nationwide market emerging, empire-wide market emerging because of the very backwardness of the transportation. There was a second very serious problem that Russia was afflicted with. This was the problem of labor. In Russia, because of the extreme climate and because of the inhospitable terrain of the lands, the general propensity of uh, demographic uh, clusters, the general propensity of settlements, the general settlement patterns tended to be located in very small areas. So there would be areas which had a huge, a very high density of population and then there would be vast stretches of the countryside which were completely uninhabited, completely uncultivated. In this kind of a situation of extreme uh, climatic conditions, all activity, all economic activity had to be carried out under the very old traditional system of serfdom. Serfdom, which had more or less phased out of Western Europe by the 15th and the 16th centuries and had begun to be assailed in other parts of Eastern Europe by the end of the 18th centuries and it had collapsed as far east as in Prussia in the early 19th century, survived. It was alive and kicking in Russia till the second half of the 19th century.
There was a reason for this. Because of the harshness of the climate, mobility of labor was completely unthought of. Because all the economic activity would be considered to be the responsibility of the estate of a feudal lord. The feudal lord was in charge essentially of all the productive activities in a region from which he would extract the social surplus and transmit to Moscow by way of revenue. This responsibility of the feudal lord had its inevitable corollary in the practice of serfdom. Because the feudal lord was responsible for the total volume of production and for the revenue to be handed over, he made sure that labor remained to work this thing out. And because of the harshness of the climate and because of the problems of the market, the feudal economy in Russia tended to be labor intensive rather than capital intensive. So more and more units of labor had to be thrown into cultivation of the lands. This did not mean that all in economic activity would necessarily have to be limited to agriculture. There were areas where in spite of throwing more and more units of labor into the agricultural estate, adequate agricultural surplus would not be generated. In Russia, the tendency towards artisanal production also therefore had to be orchestrated by the feudal lord. If the agricultural productivity was not adequate in a particular estate, the feudal lord would encourage the serfs to engage in artisanal production. He would essentially specify the products to be manufactured, he would specify the price at which it had to be sold and this was principally being, in, being mindful about how much revenue was required. So when the Western economic competition began, Western industrial competition began to affect the central industrial region of Novgorod, for instance. It was the Russian feudal lords who would tend to encourage the serfs to go out and acquire industrial technology from other sources. So a serf would occasionally be given a charter of almost temporary freedom. A serf would deposit an amount with the feudal lord and would be allowed to leave the estate to which he was otherwise tied. And he would then go and acquire from other parts of Europe industrial technology and he would then be bound to bring it back and introduce such technology in the um, Russian um, estates. In so doing, for people like Putilov, who began as a serf, ended up having a huge industrial um, conglomerate under his command by the end of the 19th century. It was Putilov who, for instance, for the first time went ahead and brought new mining and metallurgical techniques into the land of the Urals. In fact, there were other enterprising characters associated with the incipient industrialization of Russia in the 1860s who had begun their lives as serfs. Morozov and Ryabushinsky are very good examples of this. In the Russian estate, therefore, the serfdom, the practice of serfdom was not as constrictive as it tended to be in Eastern Europe, in, in, particularly in lands such as Prussia. Nevertheless, there were problems of movement. So whether a serf would be allowed to venture outside Russia, whether it would be allowed to venture outside the estate was dependent entirely upon the goodwill of the Russian feudal lord. Additionally, although there were provisions in the Russian feudal setup for the serfs to acquire private property through their own enterprise so that they have some incentive for production, how much rights they would be given, how much property rights they would actually enjoy depended basically on the goodwill of the Russian lord. So it was a system that was largely arbitrary. Almost everything depended upon the feudal lord's calculation of how much freedom we could give the serfs in order to generate revenue. And he was particularly mindful of the fact that in the, how, in the climatic conditions of Russia, mobility of labor was a bad idea. So a large number of the Russian people who are beneath the station of either the feudal lords or the urban uh, bourgeois 
um, characters, which are fair and few and far between, the bulk of the Russian population remained working in the agricultural estates owned either by the state or by the feudal lord or by the king himself. It is not, however, that the serf, the population, was deployed only in the estates, in the agricultural estates of the vast regions of Russia. In the Ural region, for instance, the industrial and the mining activities in the Urals was carried out almost entirely on the back of servile labor. The, uh, the Ural region being still more inhospitable in terms of climatic conditions, it was considered com equally inadvisable in the Urals to give any sort of freedom of movement to the laborers. Hence, the people tended to be locked onto uh, the mines and the industrial enterprises over there. And this, the Russian government had full support in, largely because the mining region of Urals was geared entirely, almost entirely, to the uh, military sort of production for the Russian state. So the mines of Urals were being, uh, and, the, and, the, and the coal and iron industry of Urals was principally uh, devised and run with the aim of meeting the demands generated by the state by means of warfare. So long as there was no social imbalance in the Russian empire, inside the Russian empire, uh, the way there was developing in France or Germany in the early 19th century, the Russian Empire considered itself to be particularly safe. The change really begins when Russian industrial backwardness was thrust onto it by way of a big news of the defeat in the Crimean War. In 1854-56, the, the period of the Crimean War a realization began to dawn in Russia that Russia's industrial backwardness could prove to be very, very costly in terms of its uh, efficacy and in terms of its stature as a good, uh, as a major European political power. In the war that was fought in, a, in, the, in the Crimean region of uh, the Russian South, Russia was decisively defeated by a coalition of British and French troops fighting on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. And the principal lesson that Russia learned from this decisive drubbing, the most probably one of the most significant turning points in the history of Russia in the modern times, was that industrialization gave Britain and France an edge in that age that Russia did not have. Britain and France could swiftly transport their troops on the back of railways and on the back of steamship navigation Whereas Russia, even though it was basically pooling its troops from all parts of the Russian Empire, the physical difficulties of transporting the troops into the Crimean region proved to be a very uh, decisive factor in the defeat of the uh, empire. So the Russian elite in the wake of the Crimean War resolved that Russia too had to industrialize in order to relevant, remain relevant in the scheme of balance of power in Europe. And it was largely with the decisive determination on part of the state that Russian industrialization begins as a process. The problems that were identified right away were very simple. That Russia too needed railways the way um, the rest of Europe had. The realization that Russia needed railways in order to remain relevant uh, in the European scheme of things was accompanied by a further realization that Russia must be able to develop industrially in order to sustain that railroad development. And it was further realized that the principal problem of any, any economic development in Russia was that there was no united market. So the demand that could sustain industry would have to be generated by the state itself. There was the additional problem of the immobility of labor, which had by this time been identified as one of the driving features of industrial societies. And there was the still further problem, a greater problem in many respects, was the problem of capital accumulation. Because Russia was divided into a cluster of five, of, so four or five different regional economies, none of which were economically very vibrant, not much capital was being accumulated. 
And since Russia was a late starter in the direction of industrialization, Russia needed to generate more capital because it had to buy far more expensive technology than any of the other European powers had to. So what was designed as a remedy was a thorough structural overhaul of the czarist apparatus. And the fundamental problem that was identified as the thing to start with was the, the practice of serfdom. Serfdom in Russia was abolished by means of three decrees, three emancipation edicts, 1861, 1864, and 1866. In 1861, all serfs employed in private estates of feudal lords were given their freedom. In 1864, freedom was given to state-owned serfs. And in 1866, freedom to, uh, was given to serfs employed in the, in the Russian South, particularly in the Urals region. The manner of emancipation has important resonances for subsequent Russian history. So it's probably important, so it's probably useful to uh, look into this for a brief while. Estates, the feudal estates were essentially broken up into lands that would belong to, uh, would, that would continue to belong to the feudal lord and those that would be given to the village of, um, the, Russia, of, of the peasants, which was collectively known as the mir or the obshina. Generally, what happened was a third of the land would be given by the feudal lord away to the mir for cultivation, in return for which the feudal lords would be receiving a compensation from the state. Because the peasantry were unable to buy their freedom, the, pe the state came forward and extended the compensation payment to the feudal lord, who therefore did not sustain any loss by giving up his command over the, uh, over the servile labor force that he had. And in return for the compensation that the state would pay, the mir over a period of 49 years, over a period of, uh, in, by means of 49 annual installments, would pay back to the Russian is a state the compensation that had the Russian state had paid on their behalf in 1861. This, the structural problem that this manner of emancipation posed before Russia was particularly significant. It was this, that since the Mir was, was made responsible for a repayment of the total amount of compensation, the Mir was never willing to let the Russian serfs leave or, or the erstwhile serfs to leave freely. So the basic idea that emancipation of the serfs, the abolition of serfdom, would generate, would liberate the Russian labor force for use in the industry, would ultimately not really work out for a fairly long time till, in fact, the Stolypin reforms, which we will come to discuss later. A further problem was that when the lands were being given away to the serfs, the one-third land that was given away generally tended to be also the least fertile of the lands that were being given, uh, that were, that belonged to the estate. The feudal lords would generally tend to retain the most fertile lands, giving away the, uh, the less fertile lands to the mere. The surplus which was generated, uh, the bulk of which went to the repayment of the compensation. As a result, most often the peasantry would have to look for work as agricultural labor on the land of the feudal lord. In fact, on the, perhaps sometimes the very lands on which he used to till previously. The problem pertaining to the emancipation of serfs, therefore, was twofold. On the one hand, lay the fact that labor was not free to move even after emancipation for all practical purposes. There were exceptions, of course, because if a land would be particularly unproductive and if a, uh, if a serf, uh, if a peasant was willing to leave, he would be allowed to leave by the mere only when someone else was accepting his revenue obligations. That much of freedom the mere certainly gave. But 
um, for all other practical purposes, the mobility of the serfs, uh, of the erstwhile serfs, remained very restricted. There was the still further problem. The, it was hoped that once the Russian peasantry would be given their freedom, they would be gaining incentive to produce more, to increase productivity, to earn more, and therefore also to generate a demand for a domestic industrial activity. If the Russian peasant would consume more, then the Russian industry would also have urge to innovate and cater to a larger market. This did not happen because of the poor quality of the land that was handed over, because of the fact that the Russian peasantry had to eke out an existence hiring himself out as an agricultural labor, and because of the high compensation payments paid to the state, the Russian peasantry never was able to function as the market that the industry could cater to. So by the mid 1860s and early 1870s, the Russian peasantry had been liberated from serfdom, but they were still unable to generate the sort of industrial demand that could sustain industrialization. This is the reason why from the 1860s, the Russian state itself decided to function as the principal generator of industrial demand and industrial activity that began in Tsarist Russia in the second half of the 19th century tended to revolve around the state itself. This was the point where Russian industrialization was completely dis distinct in its trajectory of development from all the other European powers.